your stuff too, all right? But in the insta the first instance, it's written for the opponent, and just listen to the language of these uh, of this uh, document. Briefly put, this arose in federal court, at United States District Court. Unfortunately, this fellow got involved with this before meeting us, so a lot of this was already underway. It had to do with the income tax matter. And this is motion to vacate ruling, motion to dismiss, and notice of disqualification of Robert W. Gettleman acting as judge. In this particular situation, we did a separate um, document to uh, object to the ruling. <coughs> uh, comes now defendant, and I won't give his name, sui juris, living, breathing, natural born, sovereign American citizen, with and claiming full, unlimited, inalienable rights, guaranteed in the constitutions of the United States of America and in the constitution for the state of Illinois, whose proper name is properly spelled in upper and lower case letters only. This court and the presiding judge are required, pursuant to the oath taken by the presiding judge, and the constitutional requirements to abide by his oath in the performance of his official duties, to uphold the federal constitution and all rights guaranteed therein. Therefore, defendant hereby strenuously objects to the unconstitutional and unfounded ruling by the presiding judge to deny defendant's motions pursuant to the oath taken by the man acting as presiding judge for the following reasons based in fact and law and constitutionally supported. One, it is an irrefutable fact that the Constitution of the United States of America is the supreme law of the land. However, the man acting as judge in this action, Robert W. Gettleman, pursuant to his oath, consistently denied the Constitution of the United States of America rights guaranteed therein and subordinated so-and-so's substantive rights to procedural due process of law, which in fact was no due process at all. Gentleman has no constitutional authority to deny the Constitution to which he took an oath and to which he owes his limited delegated authority. Thus, by his own actions, Gettleman has perjured his oath, committed sedition and insurrection against the Constitution, and since he is backed by an array of armed force of treason, pursuant to constitutional requirements supported by Chapter 1, Code of Conduct for United States Judges, in particular Canons 2A and 3A, Gettleman is disqualified for the reasons herein stated. 2. When defendant asked Gettleman to affirm his oath of office, Gettleman responded by stating that he is not here to answer questions. Upon Gettleman's refusing to affirm his oath of office on the record, defendant then disqualified Gettleman and told him to step down. Gettleman's refusal to affirm his oath of office rendered the entire court defective and constitutionally incompetent and without jurisdiction. Yet, despite these facts, the traitor Gettleman continued to violate due process of law by denying judicial notice, converting the court to a judicial forum, operating under Article 3 of the Constitution, which is the only proper venue in which so-and-so, an American citizen, may lawfully appear, and which he had every right to demand. Yeah, Bob. Bob's political status was filed on the public record as being an American citizen and not a U.S. person or citizen, which status would make him a member of the District of Columbia and a subject of the U.S. government, which he is not. Gettleman's actions rendered this court a treasonous court, entirely incompetent, and defendant has no requirement to proceed in a constitutionally incompetent, defective court, as Gettleman unlawfully compelled him to do. Defendant is guaranteed a fair and impartial Article III court, presided over by a fair and unbiased judge, with his full constitutionally guaranteed rights and due process of law upheld and cannot lawfully be compelled to appear under coercion and duress in an administrative court which has jurisdiction only over U.S. citizens and other subjects of the district, a status which, as stated, does not apply to God. <coughs> Three, it is an irrefutable fact that since the Constitution is the supreme law of the land, it is therefore the highest authority in this nation. Yet despite this fact, Gettleman exceeded his limited authority 
unlawfully supplanted the Constitution, placed himself in a position of higher authority than the Constitution, which is treason, by denying and opposing the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, and defendants' rights guaranteed therein when he denied Bob's motion to claim and exercise constitutional rights and require the presiding judge to rule upon this motion and all public officers of the court to uphold said rights. Again, this action by Gettleman, in contradiction to his oath, constitutes a perjury of oath, sedition, insurrection, and treason, and further is a trespass on the rights of Bob, an American citizen, and not a subject of the district, which is the only class of citizen over which the district court has any lawful jurisdiction. Four, it is an irrefutable fact that officers of the court are required to abide by their oaths in the performance of their official duties, especially those before the court. However, by his own actions, as specified herein, and as noted on the public record, Gettleman, in addition to his other unconstitutional actions described above, further defied the Constitution and acted in dereliction of his duties when he denied Bob's motion to demand this court read all pleadings, defend and files with this court, and adhere only to constitutionally compliant law, and more particularly the Bill of Rights in his rulings. It remains to be seen whether Gettleman's unlawful, unconstitutional actions, including but not limited to denial of due process, sedition, insurrection, and treason, are condoned by this court by and through those with oversight responsibility. A reasonable man would argue that since it is an irrefutable fact that the first duty of any public officer who has taken an oath of office to support the federal constitution is to support and defend the Constitution and not act in opposition to it, as Gettleman flagrantly did when he admitted in open court that he had not read the pleadings and didn't know what they meant, then he proceeded to deny them. Then those court officers with oversight responsibility for this court, pursuant to their oaths, cannot lawfully uphold Gettleman's unlawful, unconstitutional actions. To do so would, at minimum, constitute misprision of Gettleman's crimes, and at worst, sedition, insurrection, and treason on the part of those court officers. Five, it is an irrefutable fact that since the first duty of any judge is to uphold and support the federal constitution, Gettleman, by his own actions, failed that duty when in opposition to the constitution and defendants' rights guaranteed therein. He denied Bob's challenge of jurisdiction and motion to dismiss for lack of jurisdiction. Since there were no motions from the prosecution to rebut any motions entered by defendant, the motion should have been granted. However, Gettleman, whose duties required him to be fair and unbiased, took it upon himself to leave the bench and act as prosecuting attorney against defendant, thereby demonstrating bias in favor of the prosecution, a blatant violation of his duties as a judge, which rendered the court defective, incompetent, and without jurisdiction over Bob, an American citizen claiming full rights protected by the Constitution. Six, it is an irrefutable fact that in order for the district court to be a constitutionally competent court with lawful jurisdiction to try American citizens, it is required to conduct proceedings under the mandates of Article Three, whereby the Constitution, constitutionally guaranteed rights, and due process of law are faithfully upheld. Yet, by the actions of this court, by and through Gettleman, the Constitution was denied, forbidden, and treated with contempt, and Bob's political status, which only he and no one else can determine, was ignored and denied throughout the entire proceedings in this court, which, again, is treason by all public officers involved who witnessed the treason but took no action to prevent or correct it. The court in which Gettleman presides is known as a United States District Court, operating under Article I or Article IV of the Constitution, and does not operate under Article III as required as a District Court of the United States. Therefore, this court perpetrates fraud by conducting proceedings against an American citizen bar and has no lawful authority or jurisdiction over him, nor does this court have any authority or jurisdiction to prosecute alleged income tax violations. It is an irrefutable fact that pursuant to his oath, Gettleman failed his duties thereunder by violating Bob's due process rights in that since the prosecution failed to respond to or rebut Bob's motions, then pursuant to Rule 7 and 8 of the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure, 
which Bob cite under equal treatment under the law and which state that such failures constitute consent and admission, respectively, these motions should have been granted and not denied. Further, Gettleman failed to support his ruling by citing any basis in any fact in law because there is no fact and valid law which can deny the constitutions and rights guaranteed therein. Therefore, Gettleman's unconstitutional ruling is opinion only. An opinion cannot be used as a valid basis for any lawful ruling in a constitutionally competent court, pursuant to Gettleman's oath. Gettleman's treasonous ruling renders the entire court without any perceived jurisdiction, and this case must be dismissed. Gettleman, who by his own admission failed to read any of these motions, took it upon himself to unlawfully and unconstitutionally deny all four motions. Gettleman's actions constitute a blatant denial of, including but not limited to, Bob's due process rights and flagrant dereliction of Gettleman's sworn duties as a judge. It is an irrefutable fact that when a defendant in the instant case defended Bob has entered into the court record, buying through exhibits his statement of his political status, and then the court denied and ignored Bob's status, it is an enticement to slavery by Gettleman, who has no authority over an American citizen such as Bob, nor any authority to compel him to submit to a fraudulent designation of his political status just to get the hearing over with. By enticing Bob to submit to a fraudulent designation of his political status, Gettleman compelled him into a position of involuntary servitude to a foreign jurisdiction known as the district, in contradiction to Bob's stated, publicly acknowledged, correct, and unrebutted political status, which, as previously referenced, was declared in all four of the previous unrebutted motions defendant filed with this court. The reference document of political status is herein made part of this objection and attached hereto as Exhibit A. It is an irrefutable fact that no man acting as judge in the instant case Gettleman is a higher authority than the federal constitution and rulings made by the Supreme Court of the United States of America. Therefore, Gettleman has no constitutionally authorized lawful authority to deny, defy, subvert, or overrule Supreme Court rulings and the constitution and the powers and rights guaranteed therein to Bob. Yet he did so when he denied all of defendant's constitutional rights motions and left the bench to prosecute defendant for the benefit of plaintiff, a blatant violation of Canon 3A of the Code of Conduct for United States Judges. It is an irrefutable fact that the United States Supreme Court held in its landmark ruling cited herein, quote, where rights secured by the constitutions are involved, there can be no rulemaking or legislation which would abrogate the Miranda v. Arizona. Defendant has a guaranteed fundamental right in the Confrontation Clause of the Sixth Amendment to be present in any and all proceedings against him and to confront and to cross-examine the witnesses against him. However, defendant was denied this right because he was not informed of the grand jury proceedings against him nor of the nature and cause of the accusations against him. Since he was not notified by the government or the Department of Justice or the Internal Revenue Service of his right to appear and be involved in the grand jury proceedings. Lawful notification is the first essential of due process of law, see Connolly. Further, under Federal Rules of Criminal Procedure 3, Grand Jury A, summoning a grand jury, Rule 6B1, states to wit, either the government or defendant may challenge the grand jury on the ground that it was not lawfully drawn, summoned, or selected, and may challenge an individual juror on the ground that the juror is not legally qualified. Defendant was entitled to be present and involved with the process of selecting the grand jury. But since defendant was not informed of his right to be present, nor was he summoned when the jury selection took place, it was impossible for him to challenge the grand jury on any ground. In fact, the only summonses issued were to defendants White and Son, which summonses were improperly issued in that they were not issued and signed by a federal judge. The government has a duty pursuant to oaths taken and constitutional requirements thereunder to deal lawfully with the people, in the instant case defendant, and to file against him only valid lawful charges based upon valid constitutionally compliant laws specific to the Bill of Rights. By its own actions, the government entirely failed to uphold these requirements. Therefore, defendant's fundamental rights were denied and violated from the very inception of this matter. 
any court of constitutional competence pursuant to the oath taken by the presiding judge, in this case, Gettleman, cannot lawfully hear a case based upon charges which result from violations of fundamental rights and due process of law. Thus, this case must be dismissed. Still further, pursuant to Federal Rules of Criminal Procedure 12B3A, which states to wit, motions that must be made before trial, the following must be raised before trial. A, a motion alleging a defect in instituting the prosecution. It is obvious that by the actions of the Department of Justice, DOJ, and the Internal Revenue Service, IRS, which violated the above reference Rule 6B1, defendants' fundamental rights were denied in the conduction of the grand jury proceedings, which constitutes a blatant defect in instituting the prosecution of this case. In light of this fact, defendant hereby moves the court, pursuant to Rule 12B3A, to dismiss this entire action for defects in instituting the prosecution. Further, IRS agents misrepresent to federal grand juries by stating under oath that they are lawful employees and special agents of the federal government and misrepresent that the IRS is part of the government when in fact it is not. Article 1, Section 1 of the Constitution vests all legislative power in Congress and all laws created by Congress must be constitutionally compliant and specific to the Bill of Rights. Further, those laws can never supersede rights guaranteed to the American citizens in the Constitution. Congress never created the IRS by an act of Congress, nor did Congress vote the so-called Title 26 into law. Therefore, the IRS is not a part of the government of the United States of America. Thus, the IRS and Title 26 have no binding force or effect whatsoever upon any American citizen in the instant case, Bob, and any official body of government which states otherwise perpetrates fraud and commits treason by its own statement. The federal Constitution imposes requirements upon all public offices. Therefore, it is obvious to any reasonable human being of even modest intelligence and competence that since the above-referenced officer of the court failed these requirements, then he has no lawful authority to serve in office in any capacity, nor to conduct any duties of any office, and to do so is blatant fraud, impersonating a lawful public officer and treason against the people. In the instant case, it can't defend it, Bob. Thus, Bob's demand that Gettleman step down from the bench was entirely lawful and correct, but Gettleman refused to step down in defiance of the Supreme Law. It is an irrefutable fact that anyone who has previously taken an oath and then acts in insurrection and sedition against the Constitution, pursuant to the self-executing sections 3 and 4 of the 14th Amendment to the federal Constitution, vacates his office upon commission of the crimes and or treason, and forfeits all benefits of that former office, including salaries and pensions. Public offices involved in this case have invoked these sections as specified above, and thereby have vacated their offices and had and have no lawful authority whatsoever to have engaged in any actions in the above reference proceedings. The governmental agency is not an agency of the U.S. Treasury or the United States government and has no lawful force or effect over American citizens. In the instant case, Bob, a sovereign American citizen who claims all of his constitutionally guaranteed rights. Further, Title 26 of the USC has never been enacted into law by Congress and has no binding force or effect upon Bob. What is not authorized in the Constitution is prohibited by the Constitution. No constitutional authority exists for the IRS to lay and collect taxes from the American people. The Constitution delegated specific limited powers of taxation to Congress, and Congress did not delegate its authority to the IRS. Since Congress did not pass legislation creating the IRS as part of the government of the United States of America, or the so-called Title 26 into law, then neither the IRS nor that title have any lawful authority upon which to take any actions against American citizens in the instant case. But no department of government can ever lawfully uphold the fraud perpetrated by the IRS, including this court and the DOJ, nor can the DOJ represent a non-governmental body or non-governmental employees. When no authority exists, no authority can be conveyed. As previously stated, government is required to lawfully deal with the people and only file lawful charges against them. In the instant case, Bob, 
And it is obvious by the actions of the government in this matter, as described herein, that this has not occurred. If the presiding judge pays income taxes, then he presides in a United States District Court and not a District Court of the United States. Thus, he has no lawful authority or jurisdiction to hear this case, and the sham court has no lawful authority or jurisdiction to decide the issue. Thus, this case must be dismissed. There is evidence that IRS agents have bribed United States attorneys and federal judges with kickbacks for a criminal indictment issued by a federal grand jury in blatant violation of all aspects of constitutional responsibilities, including but not limited to due process of law. Hang on, guys. I repeat where I left off. There is evidence that IRS agents have bribed United States attorneys and federal judges with kickbacks for a criminal indictment issued by a federal grand jury. Therefore, defendant respectfully demands that all charges alleged against him be dismissed, or in the alternative, pursuant to his rights guaranteed in the Constitution to defendant and constitutional requirements imposed upon government, then defendant respectfully demands that the government and not the IRS certify, one, all the above stated facts are false based in fact and law which support the government's opposition to said facts. Two, it has acted lawfully in all aspects of its dealings with X. Three, the charges alleged against X are valid charges based upon valid existing law in compliance with the Constitution specific to the Bill of Rights. Defendant demands certification in the form of a sworn and notarized affidavit by the charging government officer signed under penalty of perjury of the laws of the United States of America attesting to the above stipulations. Should the government fail to certify charges in violation of due process of law, then the government admits its charges are invalid, unlawful, unconstitutional, and this court is lawfully required to dismiss them forthwith. In the alternative, by the actions of all those involved in this matter pursuant to constitutional violations which always provide a constitutional remedy, defendant has no choice but to sue each and every one individually, privately, personally, and in their professional capacities, as well as all other public officers of any and all supervisory or oversight capacities whatsoever in each and every department within this jurisdiction. Wherefore, defendant hereby respectfully requests this court, pursuant to constitutional requirements, grant this motion to vacate ruling and motion to dismiss and to act upon the notice of disqualification and thereby disqualify Gettleman from this proceeding. The granting or denying of these which will determine either the constitutional allegiance of this court or, in the alternative, the court's continued treason. In a situation like that, in a situation like that, it would be very difficult to do anything through the courts, okay? You could try, but you wouldn't get anywhere. So if it comes down to that, if the government is going to have to declare war on us, then it's up to the American people to show up and be American people. If not, they don't deserve the country. Okay. Thank you very much, folks. No, 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 no. Lindor, okay. I just want to say that all of us, the three of us, I'd like to say a prayer for all of us that we have all found our oneness with God and the great inheritance that God has with us. It is not alone that we're going to win this fight. It's pretty big, and it's going to take God to win it. So I say that prayer for all of us, that we walk worthy of God in this correction, and that we give all credit to God. And I have a joke for you. Amen. The robber went into the bank, and he said to the teller, one peep out of you and your geography. She says, don't you mean history? He says, don't change the subject. Thank you, Ms. Warren. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Thank you for all this. At some point, there was something that went around. People were putting their names or e-mails or something. Will we get some sort of a list? Thank you, Ernie. It's going to the government, basically. Yeah. Jim or Jim and Neil, I have to get a hold of you if you want. That's okay. Thank you. Thank you.
No, that's bad. If Arnie's in front of it, Arnie, if you're in front of the screen and videotape us, that's good. Take care. I'll be here for a while more. I gotta download some of my stuff over to his computer over there. They bribed me. Yep. You're, you're in Connecticut, right? Yeah, so you're interested in getting together. Uh, Jake said we should group together now. You've got to talk to him. Okay, Arnie, you rolling? It's going. You're rolling. It's going. Okay, folks, I, this woman came up. This woman came up to me in the uh, hometown cafe buffet. And she ran up to me and she said, I want your hat. She said, I want to buy your hat. But I gotta have that hat. I love it. And I love this hat too. So I said, Well, please come back to me in ten minutes. And I was waiting for what to do. And one fellow said, Well, say no, and she walked and she took out of her pocket all the she had twenty dollars. And one fellow said, Wait a minute, and she go up on her price. And then another fellow says, Don't do it, it's part of you. And another fellow says, Go ahead and do it. Well, I waited. And guess what? I heard the decision. I've got to give her my hat. I'm going to give it to her. So this is, this is Albert LeBrun. He lives in Stafford Springs. So tonight, Albert is taking it to his, or tomorrow, he'll take it to his office. And he'll give it to the woman, and her name is Anne. Thank you, Albert. Goodbye, Green Hat. Goodbye. Goodbye, Hat. You go on your own.